will actually meet in person if we haven't. Um, so really, really excited to see everyone over Zoom today. Um, welcome. Again, as I said last week, this is a kind of, on the one hand, it's sad for me that I'm not seeing people face to face and it's difficult not to be in a room with people and have the dynamic and the energy and everything else which is definitely lacking on the other hand I think this has given an opportunity especially this year where I was only going to end up teaching one class because I was taking a kind of a half sabbatical um, it's given me the opportunity to still touch base with all of my wonderful women in, and men in all of my classes um, and um, to see you all over zoom so I'm very excited about that and obviously Obviously, also for people that are signing in that wouldn't have been able to attend Yerushalay in Australia, England, America, I'm not so sure because the time is not great, but all the other places, um, really, really excited to see you all. As I said, I'd love this to be some kind of, it's not going to be able to be totally interactory. Um, we're already up to 100 people. Last time we had over 150. And I know this isn't going to be, a, we're not going to be able to achieve um, a real dialogue over Zoom. But what I definitely would love is for you, if you have a question or a comment, to put it on the chat. And I will try and um, keep up or lack of, right, to, to, to watch as we go and to bring in any comments that are relevant. I will also, last week I didn't have, I didn't leave enough time, but I will also leave enough time at the end for you to open up your speakers and for us to be able to have a discussion where need be. I had a little bit of time last week, but I didn't leave enough. Um, and obviously after the class, once we get this class going as a permanent class, once next week we see who's definitely going to be in the class and who isn't, and I'd love you all to be, um, what I will do is those that want me to add you, if I already got an existing WhatsApp, I'm the only person that can write on it, so it's not going to be driving you crazy the entire time, but um, on that WhatsApp group, what I do is I send relevant um, articles or comments or things that um, might be relevant to the class um, and um, it just allows us to continue a dialogue you can always message me privately obviously you can send me an email and I'd love to keep that dialogue for me that's for me that's the learning experience I always say I come to the class I often learn much more than I give because of all the feedback that I get um, and I want to begin specifically with the feedback um, one one particular message I got last week from um, Danielle Mella my long-term standing as a student I don't like using that word in Zichron um, who wrote to me after the class and she said as follows and I think it's a great way to begin today's class because it kind of summarizes what we did last week um, and brings it forward to this week and it's also a beautiful comment she she says, um, um, I wanted to add, but didn't have time. And again, I really invite you all at the end of the class, those of you that have got something you'd like to say, please open your microphones, don't feel embarrassed, please share with us. Um, she says, I wanted to add about the Midrash, about the fragmentation of truth changed for me today when you spoke. If you remember last time we spoke, I brought in the Midrash, we didn't actually see it inside, but I brought in the Midrash about the thro throwing of truth down to the earth in the sense that the we spoke about the Shivim Panim the Torah, the 70 faces of Torah, we spoke about the idea of polarization in today's world, about the idea that we are living in a very, very, and I suppose in some senses, COVID has made that even more um, obvious. Um, um, and it's manifested itself in a more extreme way. But the polarization that we're seeing today is a result in many senses of what um, um, I remember Michal Goodman speaks about this idea of a lack of curiosity. When we don't have curiosity towards the other side, when we're not interested, when we don't see a mystery even in existence or a mystery in humankind, we've lost the ability to see something other than our own view. And that obviously is hubris rather than humility. And this is what Danielle says. She says, the midrash of the fragmentation of truth changed for me today when you spoke. The first time I saw this, not only as a message that each person can understand, but a small bit of truth and never own, uh, sorry, but a small bit of truth and never own the full truth. But maybe more importantly, we must rely on listening to the other to get to a fuller truth. And I think that's exactly what the midrash is bringing. She said, humility is built into this understanding of truth. This explains 
why Machloka is the essential method of learning and not solitary study. The fragmentations are like those pearls in the bottom of the ocean. That if you remember, Heschel speak, spoke about last week. No one, no one person can collect them all. But if we share what we find, we will all be the richer. And I thought that was really beautiful. And I always said, I said to you, I bring the Heschel source into every class every year because I think it's such a beautiful motif. It's such a beautiful analogy of the each generation having the Torah pearls of wisdom lie at the bottom of the ocean, meaning they're there, they exist. But it's us, we bring the Chiddush by uncovering those pearls. And as Danielle said, not every single person can collect all the pearls of wisdom. And what we're meant to do is to share them. So I think that's a really beautiful way. And if you remember last way of understanding it, and if you remember last time we left off, we finished with, um, with um, Ariel Berger, who spoke about um, Eli Wiesel's teaching methodology. And one of the last things he said, or he spoke about was the notion of vulnerability and how vulnerability is, um, is the greatest weapon if you're brave enough to use it. Now, and in today's, um, social or I should even say you know kind of um, um, modern social psychology um, and you have people out there speaking you know to to even the lay person people like Brene Brown and there's there's many others who speak about this notion of vulnerability. Brene Brown happens to be a um, so I think she's a social doctor in social psychology and she her, her thesis was on the notion of vulnerability and she says something really profound funny enough that it connected for me as I she happened to have her her book the gift of imperfection on my bedside table and I dip into it now and again kind of when I'm trying to fall asleep it's something to read and she says um, that the notion of vulnerability allows for connection she says very often when we open our vulnerable selves up to the other that that is what creates the deep connection it's not the barriers and the super kind of the one-dimensional superficial face that we give to the world but that deep self that vulnerable self that's what allows for connection and i was thinking about that in terms of what Ariel Berger says, and even in terms of what we see in classic Talmudic literature and, 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 and the way we talk about learning Torah as machloke, as Danielle said, right? The way we talk about the notion of learning as opening ourselves up to many views and even allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, meaning is my view definitely right? And if it isn't, then that then I have to be a little bit vulnerable, right? We spoke, um, one of the sources we saw last time also was um, the idea, yes, it was the Eli Wiesel, where he speaks about the idea that one of his favorite stories is David and Goliath. Why? Because David takes his armor off. And there's something about the notion of removing his armor as the symbol, the key symbol of of, of battle. The key symbol of battle, in a sense, is that vulnerability sometimes can be our greatest weapon. And I think that um, when we're learning to write, it's such, a, it's such an important message for us. If we want to deeply connect with the text, if we want to deeply connect with the people that came before us, with all the all our ancestors, that all the Torah scholars that came before us, we have to, in a sense, allow ourselves to be open to that vulnerability, to be open to being wrong, to be open to open ourselves up. That allows for our connection with the text. Today, I want to move, and, and I hope, I really hope we're gonna, not sure we are, but I hope we're gonna finish at least the introduction today. If not, we'll finish the last bit next week. I want to move today to the idea of being and becoming. As I said to you last time, those of you that weren't um, with us last time, I'm just going to remind you, um, we, I, I said to you that this introduction is, is less of an introduction about our actual topic, that we're going to start next week, God willing, but it's more of an introduction to the notion of of learning, of thought, of, of really, I said it's a, for me a very personal journey of why thought is important, why thinking is important. Um, and one of the, the things we've spoken about is the idea of allowing for many different opinions, allowing ourselves to be open to the mystery and the curiosity of the other um, and the other's stance, the other's opinion. But the other, and obviously with that comes a sense of allowing for vulnerability and those things that we've spoken about. But the other part of that journey, I think, is the idea of, um, of becoming. 
okay or sometimes it's called being sometimes it's called becoming but the idea of the journey the idea that perhaps the end goal isn't necessarily my only um my only determining factor in this thought journey that i'm going on maybe the answer isn't necessarily where i'm heading although we always want to be heading toward the answer but perhaps in the journey itself we recognize that at the end of the day it's the journey towards the answer that gives us the answer rather than the answer itself okay and if this sounds a bit um abstract esoteric right we're gonna jump in and i'm gonna try and explain to you what i mean by that so i want to begin with one of my favorite authors um who's actually just come out with an amazing new book which i'm quoting with you today because i've got it here also but i'm gonna find it right now called leading a worthy life it's it's his new book it's sub leon cast leon cast those of you that have been in my classes in the past will be very familiar with leon cast he has a brilliant book on separation um but and this book is an, an amalgamation of various essays that he brings together. And it's not necessarily specifically on the Torah text at all, although obviously he brings in a lot of Torah and a lot of biblical messages, but it's really about living in the world today. And it's many, many different amalgamation of many different essays about what it is to lead a world worthy life one whole chat one whole part of the book speaks about marriage and relationships there's all different elements of the book now who is leon cass leon cass is professor leon cass he started as a physician he did his training in medical uh, as a medical doctor he then moved to, to biochemistry he became an ethicist a bioethicist um, and then as time went on, he, he, he speaks about his journey in this book, actually, which is, is so beautifully written. Um, but he says as time went on, he recognized that this was giving him all the answers. All the answers were there in the box, right? And he recognized that this wasn't really, though, giving him the answer of how to lead a good life. And then he became he went into philosophy. He kind of veered towards philosophy and he actually started looking. He was he was born Jewish, but he wasn't a practicing Jew. And he got, um, he met with um, someone once in Israel and he, he recognized that he didn't really understand the Bible, didn't really understand his own Judaism. Um, and, his, and he started studying it. And what he realized is or what he became aware of was the profundity of his own legacy, so to speak, his own um, inheritance. And he then um, started offering a course in university. The university allowed him to offer a course on Genesis. And from there, he began obviously writing. He wrote this incredible book on Horatia. And he became, uh, as far as I'm aware, he became a practicing Jew as well, um, an Orthodox Jew. And he, um, in any case, he is the most, I mean, if you just read a few of his things, you'll see what I mean. He's a really incredibly thoughtful, brilliant person and here he speaks about and this is the reason why i bought it he speaks about a brilliant brilliant notion he speaks about the difference between a question and a problem okay which perhaps is a, a um a differentiation that we wouldn't necessarily always make right a question and a problem right um and let, let's just have a look at what he says here because this is going to open us up to the second part of our introduction which is what i call this journey towards becoming okay and he says as follows ah now hold on i'm going to share my screen um now i just realized hold on a second before i share my screen i'm going to do something else i just realized that i haven't customized word to show it to you in the best way possible so just give me two seconds okay um now i can share my screen sorry uh, okay everyone should be able to see it now Everyone can see it? Just nod. Can you see, everyone see, share, see the screen? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so let's go to where we were up to, which is Leon Cass. Thoughtfulness, indeed all thinking from the most ordinary to the most technical has its origins in efforts to understand our experiences. Its most ordinary beginnings are in wonder, 
or perplexity. Okay, now again, remember what we spoke about. We spoke about this idea of curiosity. Okay, if we're living in a world today that lacks curiosity and is leading to fundamentalism and, 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 um, and polarization and the, all of those things we've spoken about, what Leon Kass is telling us here, that thoughtfulness, any kind of thinking, okay, has to begin with wonder or perplexity right we find something in our usually trustworthy experience remarkable puzzling or contradictory indeed it is already thought which first recognizes strangeness and contradiction in our perceptions and seeks for clarification recognition of ignorance is the beginning of thought okay so such basic ideas but expressed in such a brilliantly profound way right and really if we think about it why do we love you know there's something about a child right being with children that makes us young what is it about a child that makes us young and i always recognize this when i take my now four-year-olds for a walk and she'll stop along the way all the time and she'll stop and think that I, I would have just bypassed without even realizing. There's a curiosity, there's there's a recognition, there's even a problem, right? All the time, she's at the stage now where all the time she's asking me a million different things. And I've now bought her these brilliant books, if anyone's interested, by the way. And um, they're like books that about questions about the world, and they open up with all different questions. And underneath each flap is a different answer. And you know she's uh, we were talking about the body and then all of a sudden she says to me oh, well Emma sorry in Hebrew she speaks to me not very good um where does but but Emma where's corona in the body how does corona get into the body right and these are like questions that are there's a recognition of there's a recognition of ignorance that a child isn't embarrassed of an adult might be more embarrassed right and might be unsure and might exactly what we think that not want to open oneself up to being vulnerable and saying hold on a minute i don't understand this right but a child doesn't have those um moments of embarrassment or, or, or those kind of self-conscious moments that an adult might have but this is what leon cass is telling us thinking is something that we need to engage in and it begins with wonder with awe or even something that contradicts what we previously understood okay thinking all thinking seeks to liberate us from a slavish a slavish adherence to an unexamined opinion and an unreasonable trust in our own perceptions and experiences make no mistake thought depends on opinion and experience it uh, sorry thought depends on opinion and experience and does not reject them okay so sorry so what he's saying is on the one hand we have to have opinion and experience that's part of the thought process it doesn't reject that but on the other hand we have to also allow for what we spoke about last week allow for fallibility allow to recognize that we are limited also Rather, thought seeks to understand what is strange and wonderful and to remove perplexity, doubt, and contradiction. Yet there are two possible responses to this disquieting presence of perplexity and awareness of ignorance. Let me exaggerate and call them the willful and the thoughtful. And again, this is a brilliant differentiation that he makes, right? The willful and the thoughtful. So let's understand what he means. The willful, that kind of personality, the willful personality is annoyed with ambiguity, uncertainty, unclarity, and doubt. It seeks clarity and attitude to make the ambiguity disappear it wants to be in control of things not to be puzzled not to be at a loss it's painful to be at a loss it's natural to want to find a way willful thinking constructs hypotheses hypotheses stipulates definitions and axioms and tries to deduce from these beginnings an order of relationships in which the various observations or opinions will fit without our contradiction so for the for, for in very brief summary okay what the willful personality does is to try and solve the contradiction that I'm being I'm faced with, or try and solve the problem that I suddenly find myself in, or try and solve the um, dissonance between what I'm seeing and experiencing and what I believe. Okay, so that's the willful uh, personality, and the willful personality will try and do that with a solid framework, right? What he calls 
um, an axiom or a hypothesis which allows me to answer the problem I'm faced with or the dissonance I'm feeling and sit back comfortably in the status quo. That is the willful personality, okay? Again, those of you that have been with me over the years will recognize this is another way of framing that kind of modern philosophy that we've spoken about. In modern philosophy, even in ancient philosophy, even Socrates less so, perhaps actually Socrates and Aristotle and Plato came, they were an amalgamation of, of the willful and the thoughtful. We'll talk about that. But certainly modern philosophy, beginning with Descartes um, and further on, what they were trying to do is to construct certain frameworks in order to put um, the answers to all of our philosophical questions in a very determined and very um, thought out and straightforward boxes that would allow us to live our lives constructively, okay? And here he continues and says, etymology provides a clue, etymology being the study of where language or, or language, right? Problem comes from the Greek word problema, meaning literally something thrown out before us. When a problem is solved, it disappears as a problem, okay? a stumbling block, right? Its solution is dissolution. Further, a problem requires a solution in its own terms. The solution never carries one beyond the original problem as given. Okay, so for example, if we have a mathematical problem, okay, we need to find an answer within the framework of a mathematical equation. Okay, it will never go outside the box of the problem. And once it's solved, it's solved. The stumbling block is removed. In the English word question, query, inquire, goes back to Latin, I don't think I'm pronouncing this right, quero, and via its older form, queso, to a san Sanskrit root meaning to hunt out. Okay, so again, very interesting. The quest stop is to quest, to search out, to seek after, to be engaged in passionate pursuit. Unlike the solution to the problem, the gaining of an answer to our question does not dissolve the quest, or at least does not abolish the desire. The quest follows the query wherever it leads. It refuses to be satisfied with artificial or merely hypothetical constructs, logical or mathematical, or with poetic fictions designed to give it rest. Okay, so that's the difference. One is solving a problem. You have a problem, you solve it, it's the end. The other is a quest, and a quest can continue and continue, and it doesn't necessarily have to find its solution within the original confines of the problem, okay? Here, so I, obviously I've cut and pasted, um, um, hold on. I, Thing. is we ah okay sorry I was just checking on my own sheet okay so what we've seen here is the different I'm just going to stop here for one second and stop share and come back to it in a second um okay, I'm going to come back to I'm going to look at the second part of Leon Cast in just one second I just want to for a minute frame this idea so we have the notion of a problem and a query okay now again those of you that have been with me in past and even those of you that haven't are familiar with Rav Soloveitchik's differentiation of Adam 1 and Adam 2 will already be able right to um to apply um Rabbi Soloveitchik's Adam 1 and Adam 2 of Sefer Bereshit okay which is very relevant because we're reading it at the moment to these exact notions Right. If you remember, Adam 1, as we know, asked the how question. Adam 1 is very practical, very pragmatic. There's a problem. Let's find a solution. If you remember Adam 1's um, community, right, is the work community, right? It's the it's the pragmatic community. It's where I see the other as a means to an end. We have a goal. We need to um, function in order to provide an answer to a problem. That is Adam 1. Adam 1 is dealing exactly as Leon Cass talks about here with the problem. Adam 2, however, by the way, Adam 1 is the scientist, right? That, that's how Russell Vajic defines it. Adam 2 is the philosopher. Adam 2 is the person who goes on the quest. It's a perennial problem for him. The perennial tension of mankind is this, this kind of dichotomous, dichotomous movement between Adam 1 and Adam 2. And for him, the quest is always there. He is always moving along, trying to, and even when the answer 
is near, it's almost as if it isn't there, okay? And you get to it and then you recognize that there's more questions. That's the Adam to movement, okay? It's a constant movement in a sense the answer always evades him. It's never really truly there, okay? And that is really the, the, the movement of mankind between the problem and the question. Sometimes there is a problem to solve and other times there's a quest to go on. And we need both, okay? And again, just thinking about corona today, yeah, the problem is we need to solve corona, right? We need to solve either to get vaccination or to get tests that happen much more quickly. We need to solve this problem. On the other hand, there's also embedded in this whole existential journey that mankind is going on, it's a quest. And the quest is not just about the problem, right? The problem is the problem. We need to solve the fact that people are getting ill and dying. But the quest is a question to mankind, right? What happens, what happens to us internally in a thoughtful way when we recognize the limitations of our own, um, of our own uh, 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 goals, of our own abilities, right? What happens when suddenly we're limited? What happens when we have to be totally responsible for the other? What happens when we've created such an extreme individualism that we can't even see outside the confines of our own, own uh, alba amot, right? Our own four cubits, our own kind of small um, individual um, experience. And this is a quest. That's the quest that mankind is going on today. So this is exactly what um, Leon Cass is asking us and is addressing when he's looking at these two issues, okay? He continues and he says like this, is free thought really and always good for morality? We cannot dissolve this question. Once it's raised, we cannot send it away or solve it with some artful hypothesis and deduction. We really have no choice but to think about whether and how thinking is good or bad for character and piety. Finally, however the case for goodness or thoughtfulness, of thoughtfulness cannot rest only on its utility, whether to politics or moral or public or private life. Thoughtfulness is only not only good for it is also simply good. So, so he goes through, he discusses this question about whether thinking is good or bad, right? And again, he speaks about the idea that there's plenty of things, times when thinking may not always, thinking at its extreme may not always be good, right? But he also says that thinking shouldn't just be for, it shouldn't just be in terms of its utility. It's also sometimes simply good. It's not only good for life, it's also good living. It's about the experience of thinking. It's about the being. It's about the journey to being, not just, the, or in a sense, the journey to being is the becoming. It's not just about the end goal. Com and so he says like this, commit yourselves therefore to the careful discipline cultivation, both of that embryonic desire and of your innate human powers to understand. Do not be content, do not be content to be intellectual muscle men, thinking down all obstacles. Strive not to see through, but to see things as they are. Find your questions and follow them. Okay, and I think if we're gonna put any kind of mantra on top of the university, right, it would be, find your questions and follow them because that's a life journey a life journey is not necessarily about seeking always the answers because we all know right even those of us who are not philosophers right we all know that sometimes we get to a point in our life where we see have an answer where there's something we've been grappling with and finally we see an answer and then for some reason a year two years three years later that answer eludes us and then 10 years later, we see it in the form of another answer because answers, and Elie Wiesel always says this, answers are the end. There's no more dialogue after an answer. I'm not vulnerable anymore after an answer. There's no connection after an answer. An answer is the end, but we wanna be constantly open to becoming. And to constantly open to becoming means to constantly be in quest. Now again, 
I'm sure there will be those that ask, but what about the notion of halakha? Because if we look in the Talmudic dialogues, right, people are always arguing, there's machloket, there's this idea of the quest and the journey to questioning and following our questions, for sure. But then there's the bottom line. And I 100% agree with that. Okay? Um, I'm very much, those of you that are philosophers, philosophically orientated, my orientation is towards much more the pragmatist school of thought. The pragma American pragmatism, classic American pragmatism, with people, those that are familiar with um, John Dewey and, and, and James and, and, and William James and all of these, uh, and Charles Pierce and Charles Sanders Pierce, all of these people spoke about the idea of philosophy as constructing a practical implication in the here and the now. And I think that's very important, and in a sense, that's what Halacha brings to us. Halacha says, yes, all of that thought um, dynamic is extremely important because it, it allows you to create a meaningful and rich level of existence. But at the end of the day, we have to know what to do. And I think it's a combination of exactly what Leon Cass is speaking about, the problem and the quest, and the Adam 1 and the Adam 2, and being able to, in a sense, amalgamate, or if not amalgamate, but at least to move between the two. So as I said, this the, uh, when we jump in, what we're going to do this year is to be jumping into a lot of thinking, a lot of text analysis and understanding it as a thought process and where that thought process takes us. But I really believe that that is the fulcrum of becoming. Becoming in Judaism, and what does that mean to become? If we're looking at it from a Jewish perspective, what does it mean to be in the mode of becoming, of being, of becoming? And I think to me, that is the idea of standing before God. Of, I'm going to use a word here that we're all familiar with, but I'm going to recontextualize it for us, right? And that is the notion of Yirat Shamayim. What does it mean to be Yirat Elohim? What does it mean to be in reverence of God, right? We often translate it as fear of God, but I think it's fear is not a great translation. Okay, it's it's to be in awe, to be in reverence, right? And what does that mean in terms of our um, relationship with the text? And this is where I want to go. And this is this is going to be again part of our journey. Our journey is going to be approaching various texts but approaching them from the perspective of Yirat Elohim. And what does that mean? I'm not gonna be, to, I, I'm not coming here to bring you only kosher texts. Okay, I'm telling that again from the outset. Okay, let me actually stop share screen for a second. Um, I'm not gonna be bringing you only kosher texts. We're not gonna be looking at only things that fall within the domain of what we classically term, you know, Torah literature or halakhic literature. I'm gonna be bringing you lots of things from the outside and some of them are gonna challenge us. Okay, some of them are going to be challenging. Um, and one of the fundamental perspectives for me when approaching any of these things okay, is, to, is to approach it from the mode of, and here, here's the language that we've been using, the mode of a journey to becoming. And if we're going to use um, more from language, okay, or more religious language, to, um, to approach it from the mode of your Elohim of Yirat Shamayim. So I want to develop this idea because to me, this idea is really intrinsic to our journey, to our class's journey this year. What does it mean to be Yirat Elohim? What does it mean to approach Torah learning through the perspective of Yirat Shamayim? So in order to do that, I'm going to pull in here a non-religious text, Erech Bron, though he was Jewish, right? Um, a very famous psychoanalysis. Um, and in his book, To Have and To Be, an amazing, amazing book, right? In his book, To Have and To Be, he distinguishes between two different modes of existence. One mode of existence is the mode of having, and the other mode of existence is the mode of being. In the mode of having, in the mode of having existence, what, um, what you do is you are constantly want to... Um, the, the, the way in which you perceive the world. And again, this goes back exactly to these two modalities that Leon Cass spoke about, right? The, the modality of, um, what did he call it? It's gone out of my head a second, of thoughtfulness and the modality of um, willfulness, right? Willful, willfulness, is that what he called it? Uh, this is when I need the class here to help me. <laughs> Someone can help me if you remember. Willful, I think it was willful. Willfulness, yeah, willfulness and thoughtfulness, right? Willfulness, which we said relates in some senses to Adam 1. When I need to 
understand it, to grasp it, to put it in a box, to hold it, it's mine and it doesn't move, right? I solved the problem, right? That is, um, in, in Eric Fromm's distinction, that would be a mode of having. A mode of having is when I want to possess. I want to possess, and by the way, obviously today we're talking about material possessions. I, I feel that I will be a better person. I feel that I will, my, my experience of living will be better if I have this and I have that and I hold this and I hold that and I possess it, right? The other mode of being, which he says we've lost, and by the way, he was writing this many years before today, right? And today it's even more, um, it manifests itself in an even more extreme way, right? Um, the mode of being, right, for Eric Fromm is a mode in which I simply exist. I am being. I know that I don't need to have and to own and to possess in order to give me self-worth, in order to give my experience of living a higher dimension. Being allows me to be in the moment. It allows me to be with my knowledge without having to possess it and have it as an end answer. And I want to read to you what he says here specifically about knowledge, and it's fascinating. Okay, and here again, I'm going to share so that you can see. He says as follows. Students in the having mode of existence will listen to a lecture, hearing the words and understanding their logical structure and their meaning and as best they can, they'll write every word in their loose leaf notebooks so that later on they can memorize their notes and pass an examination. Okay, I've got nothing no, no, nothing against people writing notes. I think sometimes it's excellent, especially I know for me, it allows me, it allows it to like infiltrate when you write. But what he's saying here is the writing notes only to pass the examination is the idea of I want to possess the knowledge, pass the exam, and then it's put in a box and, 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 and kind of files away. Okay? But the content does not become part of their own individual system of thought. Okay? Enriching and widening them. Instead, they transform the words they hear into fixed clusters of thought or whole theories, which they store up, right? You can imagine it. I always imagine it is, is, is the imagery that he kind of brings is you put it in these drawers, right? You put them all in these drawers. There's actually a beautiful book about that. Um, to find it, a kid's book, actually. The student and the content of the lectures remain strangers to each other, except that each student has become the owner of a collection of statements made by somebody else. Okay, meaning I'm just made up of all of those statements, but I have, it's not actually, it's not become a part of who I am. It's kind of sits in the boxes, but it hasn't infiltrated my being, okay? Students in the having mode have but one aim, to hold on to what they learned, whether by entrusting it firmly to their memories or by carefully guarding their notes. They do not have to produce or create something new. And again, we go back here to what we said right at the beginning, which is the idea of chidush, right? The idea of chidush is the opposite of what Eric Fromm is saying here. It's not just having, it's not just learning something, possessing it, putting it away, storing it away, and not creatively immersing and connecting myself with that knowledge. So what, how does he see being? The process of learning has an extremely different quality for students in the being mode of relatedness to the world. To begin, they do not go to the course lecturers, lectures. By the way, I said this last time, I'm going to say again, any typos are mine. I literally typed it from the book. I didn't take it from somewhere. So if there's any typos, they're mine. Didn't go to the course lectures, even to the first one in a course as tabule rasa. They didn't go as an empty sheet with nothing. They have thought beforehand about the problems the lectures will be dealing with and have in mind certain questions and problems of their own. Instead of being passive receptacles of words and ideas, they listen, they hear, and most importantly, they receive and they respond in an active, productive way. What they listen to stimulates their own thinking processes. Each student has been affected and has changed. Each is different after the lecture than he or she was before it. And I just suddenly remember, I, I meant to, at the beginning of the class, Say that this lecture is um, for a refreshing, it reminds me of Rabbi Sachs, and that's why I was thinking of Rabbi Sachs. Obviously, of Rabbi Sachs, it will always be all of these lectures Harav Yitzchak, um, Ben, um, Harav Yakovsky, Ben um, Lieber. But I also want to um, dedicate this lecture to the to refreshing of two people, Eliyahu Yonatan Ben Gitzel Mira, um, and um, a cousin of my father who's very ill with Corona, who's actually a teacher in Hasmoneum, for those of you who don't know. Um, Shlome Yukutiel Ben Leah. 
at Rabbi Stephen, uh, uh, Mr. Stephen Posen. And um, I, it should be a full shame for all of them. And the reason why I was thinking that was because Rabbi Sachs always speaks about the idea of the difference between listening and hearing, right? And that's exactly that. I can hear something, it goes in one ear, it comes out the other, I put it away, I, I put, but to listen, really to listen, is to allow it to infiltrate my whole being, to allow it to change something within me, right? And that's what Leon Cass is saying here. In the mode of being, we allow the knowledge and the thoughtfulness to create something new, to create chidush, okay? Um, um, Rabbi Norman Lamb um, speaks about this idea of knowing versus learning. Okay, and, and which takes precedence. It's a, it's a beautiful essay. I could have bought the whole essay, but here I just bought a very small part to explain exactly. He also addresses this exact dynamic. And he says, scholars tell us that Plato posed an ontological question. That is a question about the very nature of reality. He said that there was a difference between being and becoming. So here, Plato talks about the idea of being and becoming. He doesn't Put them together like I've done. He differentiates them, but he's differentiating them in the same way that, for example, Eric Fromm is differentiating having and being, and Leon Cass is differentiating willful willfulness and thoughtfulness. Okay, so and and Adam one and Adam two. He's just using his language is slightly different. Being means the aim, the end result. Okay, so being is Adam one is willfulness is um, is, is 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 having right. Being is having for for Plato. But becoming is something different, right? Greek thought starting with Plato said that being trumps becoming. Being is the ideal and becoming is just the means towards achieving that ideal. So according to Rabbi Norman, I'm not sure 100% agree with him because I think actually there were plenty of people within the Greek philosophers who Dafka championed becoming over being. For example, Socrates is a classic example. But for Plato, right, he argues that for Plato and many of the other Greek philosophers, it was about finding a solution to the problem, as Leon Cass would say, okay? The end is more important, right? The word end in English, like the word tachlit in Hebrew, has two meanings. It means the final item or part, but it also means the purpose, as in the means and ends. Since the purpose is greater than what leads to it, being takes precedent over becoming. This is what he argues. He argues that in general philosophy, and I agree with him, that most modern philosophy is definitely... Um, galvanized by this kind of mindset, right? Which is the notion of being over becoming as, as, as Rabbi, as uh, Plato would have it, or Adam one over Adam two, or willfulness over thoughtfulness, or having over being, which is the idea of wanting to be able to grasp the answer, hold the answer, solve the problem, put it away in constructive, very much um, um, thesis, theses or axioms, and have them as a set answer in which I don't need to go back and readdress them, right? Or I don't need to allow them them to be part of my journey anymore because I've reached the final goal okay that is one mode of understanding it and here we get to um to what I call this idea of Yerat Shemayim and, 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 and Judaism I really believe and Norman Lamb says he continues talking about this in his essay he says Judaism is not a religion of being in Plato's differentiation it's a religion of becoming right what does that mean it's not about achieving um perfection as the final ideal right? it's not saying I'm perfect that's it I don't need to work anymore Right, I've achieved the end goal of perfection, which, by the way, a lot of the ancient philosophers that's what they were talking about. What does it mean to be the good person, to lead the moral life? Okay, to lead what they call uh, eudaimonia, the happy life. Right, that is to achieve moral perfection. And once you've achieved moral perfection, you've reached your end goal. But Judaism doesn't say that. Judaism, we are all but a late The notion of constantly being a but a late means that we are constantly on that journey, right? And I would argue that the 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 truth, right? Truth with a capital T. It, what the Greek philosophers saw as truth with a capital T is the end of the journey. I found the truth, right? 
pay for Plato, it would be to the, 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 the highest level would be it, to be able to get to the world of forms where I would see the truth about everything, right? And then you've achieved that perfection, right? It's very absolute, it's very dogmatic, it's very propositional, right? And, and in a sense, that kind of way or mode of thinking is what breaks vulnerability or doesn't allow for vulnerability it's what leads to polarization it's what leads to fundamentalism because if i believe i've achieved and found and reached the end goal i found the truth with a capital t okay i've um i i my opinion i've reached the mode of perfection okay and here i, I bring in a motif that perhaps is a bit repulsive but even the notion of becoming a martyr right a martyr is that i have reached the final moment of perfection and becoming a martyr i've achieved my goal in life that is the goal that i'm working towards i know if that's the best example but that notion of being of, of finally reaching that final moment of perfection that's um very much not the jewish way yes we are constantly moving towards the messianic period but as individuals there's never the absolute moment of perfection. There's no one perfect. And perhaps that's why the Torah exposes the vulnerability of even the most perfect of leaders. David HaMelech, what, he, what, what the Torah tells about where he faltered, right? You wouldn't expect that from David Melech, the, the greatest king of Israel, Avraham, and, and all of our all of our forefathers and foremothers, all of, all of those that came before us, these are people who all were, in, in a sense, meant to be perfect, but we see that they weren't. And that is exactly, we are all, even the greatest of us, Moshe Rabbeinu, even the greatest of us, right, are constantly a work in progress, right? You know, a work in progress. That's, that's in a sense, what we are. And that's what the Torah teaches us. When Moshe, turns around to Hashem and says, I want to try and understand you. Mashim Ha, what's your name? What's your, and he keeps going to God. I need to understand as a final answer, because that's the modality that Moshe comes from in Egypt, right? The ancient modality was that there is an end perfection, that everybody is placed in their framework, in their boxes. The Pharaoh is a kind of a God. He's placed as a perfect being, right? So Moshe keeps saying to Hashem all the time, explain to me, I need to categorize, I need to define, I need to box who you are, what is your end, what is your form, what is your perfect form, and Hashem's response is so profound, and it's totally the lesson to us, his response is, eh, yes, eh, yes. which literally translates, as I will be what I will be, or actually more, I will become what I will become, right? We all, even God himself, is transforming. And there's a transformation. I know that sounds almost heretical, right? But if we look at it from using anthropomorphism, it's in a sense what God is saying, I am like humanity constantly transformed. There's, a, there's no static, there's not a static being. There's no, nothing is absolutely static. Now, when it comes to knowing what, how to act practically in the world, yes, we need a bottom line, but that doesn't mean that that bottom line is necessarily the truth with a capital T, which is why I said last time, we always keep those bright off that we don't apply. We always keep the opinions that we don't always put into action, like Bet Shaman, because there may be a time when we need to refer back to them. There may be a time when the truth that we've applied at this moment may not be the truth that we need to apply in another moment. Okay? The constant act of interpretation, which is what Torah Shabbat Peh is, is always a mode of becoming. And this mode of becoming is what I call Yirat Shamayim. It's living, it's existing with the mindset of Yirat Shamayim. So what does that mean? So here I want to bring in the iconic Avram Yeshua Heschel. And he says like this, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, oh, no, I'm sharing it already. Ah. Sorry, I didn't realize I was still sharing it. Okay. Um, he says like this, it was Spinoza who injected into Jewish thought the idea that Judaism is not a religion, but a legal system. And this doctrine courses through the body of modern Jewish thought like venom. 
But the truth is, one who says, I only hold halakha, cannot grasp even halakha. And to say the Torah is only halakha is to espouse a non-normative view. The Torah begins not with the first legal command, but with the creation of the world, the history of humanity, the patriarchal narratives, and even with conversations involving the servants of the patriarchs. It is not the worldliness that is prior to the Torah, but the fear of heaven as well. Whoever has Torah but not fear of heaven is like a treasure who has the keys to the inner vault but not to the outer doors. How shall he enter? In this connection, Rabbi Yanai proclaimed, pity the one who has no doorway but nevertheless erects a gatehouse. Woe to those students and sages who bust themselves with Torah that have no fear of heaven. Sages knew that one could be a scoundrel, right, within the bounds of the Torah. That is within the bounds of halakha. And they said Jerusalem was destroyed only because they adjudicated solely on the basis of the laws of the Torah. And they did not practice Nim Shurut Adin. And this, I think, is particularly poignant today. And I'm not going to expand on that. But you can take it to wherever you want to take it, OK? That what Avram Yeshua Heschel is saying is, why do we not just start, like Rashi asked the question, why don't we just start with the Chodesh Why don't we start with the first mitzvah of the Torah? If the Torah is just a book of halakha, if the Torah is just a book of mitzvot, if it's just a book to give us from God all the, the very kind of distinct lessons and practicalities that we need, in a sense, and I'm going to, I'm going to um, adopt the language we've been using today. If the Torah is just a book about willfulness, if it's just a book about Adam one, about solving the problem, okay? If it's just a book about having, about possessing, about answers, right? About knowing what to do at any given moment, then we need to just have begin with the Chodesh Hazelachem. But says Avram Yeshua Heshel, no, the Torah is not just a book about being in Plato's words, right? It's not just a book about the end goal. Okay, it's not just a book about the problems. It's also a book about the questions. It's also a book about Adam too, about the quest, about becoming. In fact, maybe it's more a book about that. Maybe the fact that we begin with the perennial problems of humanity, right? Sibling rivalry, the problem of evil, the idea of how to create a social and just society, okay? The, the, all the various narratives that we find in Sefer Bereshit that are based on all the perennial questions that, that hound humanity for the rest of its existence, surely then that teaches us, right? That halakha has to be married to normative existence that if we take halakha outside of the normative existence of, of living, we've lost what that is. And says Rabbi Avraham Yeshua Heshel, what does that mean? That means that when we engage with halakha, we engage with it with Yirat Shemayim. He says, if we look at all the narratives in Sefer Bereshit, they are all based on arousing in each human individual a sense of Yirat Shemayim. Not Yirat Shemayim based on mitzvot or halakha. Yirat Shemayim based on what it is to be a good human being. On awe, on reverence, on the knowledge that there's something greater and bigger than myself and my individual desires. That's, that's where Yirat Shemayim begins. And then it's a journey to becoming. And in that journey, of course, part of that journey is adopting all of the inheritance that comes with the Torah, the interpretive modes of learning, the halakha, everything that comes with it. But it has to begin from that moment of Yerat Shamayim. By the way, just I never introduced it, but Avraham Yoshua Heschel's book, Heavenly Torah, is a huge book where he talks, he goes through all the methodologies. It's an incredible sort of book. And he goes through all the different methodologies of learning the Torah and what Torah is about, and literalism within the Torah. It really, really is sort of an amazing source of um, knowledge and, and, and some really incredible essays. Um, and here I want to then move now to, to, to this notion of what it means to, to be a Ratnelokian. And here I bring in actually Mayor Soloveitchik, who's a very well-known personality in America at the moment, a young, dynamic rabbi. 
And he, um, in a book called Intellectual Portraits of Orthodoxy and Modernity, he says as follows, he, he gives a, a quote, which you will take, you see in a minute, from here, light and sacred drought, in your light we shall see light, light and truth. These are the school mottos of the three of the West's leading universities, Cambridge, Columbia and Yale. These very phrases proudly proclaim what the Academy used to believe, right? that the knowledge safeguarded and tra transmitted was vital to the moral and spiritual survival of civilization, that faith and reason must go hand in hand, and that not only does religion enhance the pursuit of wisdom, but that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom itself. Perhaps today more than ever, this is what we've lost. This is what humanity's lost. Okay, and when I talk about Corona being a journey, maybe Corona's journey is to bring us back to the awe, to the reverence, to the curiosity, to the idea that there's something bigger than ourselves. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to believe in, in a religion. And I'm not, I, obviously I'm from Judaism, I'm not talking about being Jewish, I'm talking about humanity as a whole. But to believe that I am not the beginning and end of the story, to believe that I'm not the end, that I'm not the answer, that the answer is out there somewhere and it's bigger than I am. And it's bigger than we all are. And that's what the universities used to preach. But today, unfortunately, less so. Harold Shulwood's another very, very well-known um, um, religious thinker in America. He speaks um, exactly about this idea of fear of God in a brilliant, brilliant essay. And I, I, I did, wasn't able to bring all of it, so I've literally just bought a very small bit. I'm actually just, uh, okay. I'm gonna carry on because I'll leave. I'm gonna let anyone who's got, I haven't seen any chat. So anyone who's got any questions or, or comments, keep them. And I'm gonna leave, please gotta leave 10 minutes at the end um, for us to be able to um, address them. Okay, so he says like this, the Jewish understanding of fear of God bears connotations different from other theological outlooks. For Judaism, fear of God suspends the unethical command and liberates the believer from the bondage of scriptural liter literalness. Now, again, we're going to be addressing many texts. Okay, this is also an introduction, so I'm going to say we're going to be addressing many texts over the course of the year, some of which are going to be diff more difficult and some of which are going to be easier, some of which are written in more academic, intellectual language, and some of which are going to be written much more for the lay person. I, I'm not going to be afraid of bringing you some of those that are perhaps written in a more esoteric fashion. The reason being is that I think, and this is one of my um, gripes, that I believe that so there are so many incredible things out there in the academic world that do not get brought to the lay person. And it's such a loss in my mind. It's such a loss. You know, very often we, we're very, you know, you have people, for example, like Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and Rabbi Joshua Berman. There's people that are able to bring that intellectual academic world down to the lay person, but they're far and few between. And those that can do it, are, are, again, far and few between. Those that can do it, do it amazingly, but there's plenty that try and do it and don't and don't do it well. And then there's plenty that just kind of dumb everything down, which I don't believe in either. So what I am gonna do is I'm gonna be bringing some of those texts. I'm gonna be trying to explain them as much as possible, but I really believe that some of the ideas they bring are so profound and so important that it's such a chaval if they remain there in the ivory tower of academia and aren't brought down to the lay person. Um, so how should we, for example, this, um, this book, it's darker for the lay person, I think, more, but again, it's written in a more kind of academic way. So what he's saying here is that the fear of God, okay, um, suspends the unethical command and liberates the believer from the bondage of spiritual literateness, literalness. Okay, it's darker and an almost a paradox to what we would originally think, right? Because we originally think that if we believe in Hashem and we fear God, then we will read the text literally as it's meant to be written as the truth of the capital T. And here he turns around and he says, no, the opposite. If we really have reverence and awe, what does reverence and awe mean? It means that we don't believe we're the end. We don't believe that anyone, a long way of history, has given us a total final interpretation. And therefore it allows us to be released from the bondage of reading the scripture in a literal way, which by the way, ultimately leads to fundamentalism, okay? Paradoxically, it's the fear of God that frees the believer from the excesses of the fear of the Torah. Too close an identity of God and Torah stifles the critical conscience of human beings. Okay? And that's perhaps why 
the rabbis in that famous Agadah say, Lo that sometimes we have to separate ourselves from the voice of God in order to allow ourselves to interpret the text. Because if the voice of God is constantly hovering over us, we feel that we have no autonomy to interpret the text. For many, God and conscience are opposites, and to choose one is to surrender the other. In our view, fear of God is fear of self-betrayal of the self gifted with moral judgment. To suppress conscience is to ignore the core divine human relationship. The proper fear of God is expressed in the love of moral conscience. Fear of God does not lead to mindful subservience, but to the exercise of compassionate intelligence. To fear God is to fear one's own moral cowardice. To fear God is to fear the human hardening of the heart. A consciousness life fears no God. So in a sense, what he's saying is that our conscience, our moral conscience, our human conscience is in fact the fear of God. As we have earlier noted, there is no biblical Hebrew, Hebrew word that translates conscience. I propose that the biblical term that comes closest to the character and the role of conscience is fear of God. or Yirat Elohim. Conscience is the inter internal moral sense would even say the moral compass, right, that remains when the formal conditions for halakhic prosecution are absent. What Harold Shulwitz is saying here is something so incredibly profound, and we do not have time. I gave, those of you that are interested, I, get, I, get, I gave a shiur on the idea of um, Amalek and, um, and fear of God, which brings in all the ideas that, that of the idea of, of what I believe to be the idea of the fear of God and connects it also to the idea of the Akedah where in the end God says to Abraham you are now God fearing and how does that relate to this whole idea of moral conscience? Duff, it seems to be the Akedah is the opposite of moral conscience. So all of those ideas I have actually it's on YouTube as a, a recording so anyone who's interested I'm very happy to send it to you just message me um but so we don't have time to go into it at depth but what i really wanted to bring here and this is what's important what harold shawitz seems to suggest it seems to suggest exactly like Abraham yeshua heschel was talking to us about right the idea that the halacha is more that we have to when creating when being creative with halacha and textual interpretation we have to bring in also a sense of moral conscience which he calls Yirat Elohim which is this raw this awe this reverence not necessarily fear right but awe and reverence this idea that there's something bigger than me why do we need to bring that in when we are creating halacha because that awe and reverence creates within me number one the sense that I'm not alone, but also the sense that I am autonomous, that the voice within should be listened to, that I shouldn't just be subservient to something external, to the external halacha, the external word, but that something within me has standing, and at the same time to be aware of my own limitations, of that there is something bigger than me. Okay, so it's kind of exactly that balance that we're talking about between Adam 1 and Adam 2, right? Between willfulness and thoughtfulness, between being and becoming, okay? Between having and being, all of those things that we've been talking about. I want to end, we're going to have to end today with um, Howard Wetstein, although, let me see. Uh, uh, we, uh, next week, we're going to have to, uh, um, I'm just thinking, hold on just one second. Um... I'm just debating, I'm going to do one more source, but I'm just debating what the best source to do with, is with, okay, you know what, let's see, how, uh, ha, uh, Howard Wetzin is very, very important. Again, another incredible academic book called The Significance of the Religious Experience. Um, How Wetzin's a professor in America, a religious professor, amazing, amazing, amazing book, which really should be read by every lay person. Um, but the language is, as I said, it's, it's more, um, complex but here he talks about the idea in one whole chapter he talks about the idea of the and i'm gonna i'm gonna skip it because i really really i know there's not a lot of time and i want to leave a little bit of time Yirat Shemayim lives in the presence of awe, kind of background condition again, which he carries on nor is it only all that has become characteristic and habitual or with all come the godlike tendencies to feeling and behavior the gratitude 
okay? It engenders a sense of holiness. To characteristically feel awe is to be confronted by the holy in all sorts of unlikely places. The Yerachim Mayim live quite different lives from those of us who is both rare and transitory. Okay, so he continues asking, how can one go about creating such a life? Okay, and really what he's seeing Yerachamayim as being moments of awe. Okay, he says it's the product of character development, but the whole business is astounding. It remains difficult to imagine how we would affect such character development. I can best explain it as the role of religious practice by contrasting religion with philosophy. In fact, I'm going to leave this out. Okay, I just want to hit the last paragraph. Okay. Um, to say that religion is less a matter of good sense than is philosophy is not to denigrate it. One cannot get from A to B, from where we are to your actual mind, by simply thinking hard on the matter, not that this is a bad idea. So what he's saying is thought is not enough. It's not just about thinking. Today we think to lead the good life, perhaps we have to just think about how we're going to lead the good life. He says it's more than that. Your actual mind is about also practicing what religion seeks to achieve requires something more it more in the way of equipment that individuals have been granted what is required you may say is god's help it comes in the form of standing practices that conduce to your mind where is re where is required is god's what is required is god's help it comes in the form of inherited practices of thousands of years practice that conduces to your mind the necessary character development is the product of socialization and training it's a product of engagement with religious practice and this is what he's saying he says your mind is both the practice of your uh, engagement with um, religious practice, but it's also about knowing and understanding moments of all as creating within me this recognition that there's something more out there, that it's not just about the thought and it's not just about the practice, but there's something far bigger. And I want to develop this, <clears throat> I want to develop this further next time. And next time we're going to look and understand where you actually mind touches us when we come to the subject matter of evil and when we come to the subject matter of addressing various texts. Um, I think what I'm going to do is <clears throat> we've got a lot of sources to look through. If any of you have time over the next week to read through some of the sources, that would be great because I'm going to skip a few. I'm not going to read them all inside. I'm going to skip a few out. I'm going to summarize a few so that we can move forward to the introduction to our topic itself. Um, I want to open up the microphones now if we can. I don't know if Matan's uh I don't know who's on. Can we open up the microphones? Are there any, if anyone's got anything to ask or to share um, on chat or open your microphones? Any questions? No? Everything's clear. That's a good, that must be good. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. No questions, everything's clear, okay? Everyone agrees with everything I've said? Okay, so if there's really, really no questions, no questions at all, or are people trying to open their microphones and can't? I don't know if that's also an issue. You're, Batya, you're nodding. What does that mean, Batya? You're trying to open your microphone? Someone write on chat if they are trying to open their microphone. Someone raised the hand. Okay, I don't know what that means. Ferez raised the hand. Oh, okay, someone's just texted me, could not unmute and use the chat. Oh, you can't unmute or use the chat. Okay, um, who's on here from Matan? I don't know, Liat, Atpo, Tsipi, Okay, and on Rim Shem, we've been talking about the problem of evil. It's going to be a lot to absorb. What I suggest is, and I really do suggest this, and I, I'm not a teacher that's giving homework, but I really suggest to take the source sheets and read over them again. If you have further questions or you have something that isn't clear for you or you want clarified, I'm always at the end of an email or the end of my phone. If you send me a message and I don't get back to you, it's just because I'm with kids or busy and I will get back to you, I promise. Okay, and if I don't, then just send me again but yes there is a lot to absorb i know that didn't understand the last person you spoke about i know diana because i kind of rushed howard wetstein i really wanted to allow time for i'm going to come back to howard wetstein at the beginning of next class and i will try and explain to you a little bit more about because his 
theory is so profound it's so beautiful and i think very very spot on in terms of um what iraq elohim is so it's a shame i'm going to come back um osha give me one second okay is Moshe not getting to israel the continuation of becoming oh, okay so Matthew, that's a very interesting question um so I think there's something profound in what you're saying, and I I wouldn't ask, oh can we Charlotte Tanya, maybe, we are, Tanya sorry we have to go we've got to go we've got to go okay okay everybody um, just has to come back to the class next week and you'll give all the answers okay, come back to the class next week obviously I'll give the answers next week no I won't give the answers but we'll